at the occasion of the 300th um, anniversary of the death of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, I would like to start with this famous question of Leibniz, are we living in the best of all worlds? This question was raised by Leibniz uh, almost 300 years ago in his Theodicee. This is the only writing of Leibniz published at his lifetime. And he did this since um, his friend, the, the um, queen of Prussia, asked him to explain his ideas. They were friends, and she just had organized him um, the, um, the Prussian Academy of Science, which was the third learned society after the Royal Society in London and the, um, the Académie Française in Paris. He, had, he was a life, lifelong president, so he was very grateful to her and writing the Théodicée in French, first published in Amsterdam. And Leibniz tried something we would to get, today maybe call the impossible to reconcile uh, science and religion. This will not be the topic of my talk. Um, it, is, it, it was a really difficult gymnastics to unify and to harmonize science, metaphysics, and theology. And in the context of this attempt, he said that this supreme wisdom, united to a goodness that is no less infinite, cannot but have chosen the best. If there were not the best among all possible worlds, God wouldn't have produced any. That's a nice idea, yeah? Why should he <laughs> have a, a produced an imperfect world? Good idea. And, and now it's going to become more interesting. There's an infinitude of possible worlds. I think you, 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 you guess why I'm mentioning that. Among which God must have chosen the best, since he does nothing without acting in accordance with supreme reason. I'm just mentioning this and not wasting a lot of time in, 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 in order to, to, to qualifying uh, how he tried the impossible. Um, which other people already had done in a different way. I mean, we have pantheism of, of, of Spinoza, who did it in a completely different way. I'm not going to deliver a, 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 a lecture of philosophy. I'm just taking this nice statement, this question, are we living in the best of all worlds as the beginning of my talk? I mean, sometimes the question is fruitful and not so much the answer. So let's stick to this question. Um, we already heard uh, this quotation by, by Einstein uh, this morning by Paul. Um, Einstein once... Um, uh, told his assistant, Banish Hoffman, when I'm judging a theory, I ask myself whether, if I were God, which he almost was, I would have arranged the world in such a way. And he made a similar statement to the, to the next assistant, Ernest Strauss, which, with uh, whom he published two or three papers in the, early in the late 40s. What really interests me is whether God could have created the world any differently. That's a modern reformulation of, of, of Leibniz's question um, in the words of, 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 of a physicist. Yeah, question, had God a choice? Here you see, um, uh, Michelangelo's Godfather creating the world. And that's the question, what if? Paul already showed a little God turning the knobs. And that's an interesting question. How much can we turn the knobs and what is what if? What's happening if we mistune the world? Which touches the question of the probability or improbability of this particular nice world. Yeah, let's, have, let's take an overview of all the, the parameters and constants, starting from the more general ones and ending up in, in more detailed ones. We can start with a number of dimensions. Why the hell is it just three? Could it be two or five or ten, like in superstring theories and so on? Then we can ask some, some cosmological question. What if the cosmos is not flat? Or what if the cosmological constant is not so tiny? What if um, there would be as much matter as antimatter? Then we can switch to the fermion masses. If, what if we, we, we manipulate the quark masses, or for example, if there would be no Higgs, no electron mass, or if we manipulate the electron mass? There's a lot of exercises. I will only very superficially touch some of these questions. I think many of these things you have already 
seen or read, um, we can switch the symmetries. What if the symmetry breaking scheme would be different after Big Bang? Or if the forces would have different strengths? I will give a brief example of that. And then we could, we could but we, I, I will not have time, switch to a lot of nuclear physics question. What if the neutron-neutron binding would be attractive, which is just accidentally not attractive? What about the deuterium bottleneck, if this would be narrower? Or Fowler's and Fred Hoyle's famous triple alpha process, which made, I think, Fowler or Hoyle almost religious. There's a famous statement. So this is a whole sequence of questions, starting from, from integer numbers, from very general ones, through uh, macrocosm, microcosm, and ending up in, let's say, dirty nuclear physics. Um, it's a whole hierarchy, and I will just superficially mention some of them in order to have time for some more general questions. I think this you all know, that's Hawking's two-dimensional dog, which Hawking has stolen from Barrow and Tipler's book, and I think they also have stolen it from, from somebody else. So it's not the idea of Hawking. Just a question, what about such a beast in two dimensions? I mean, all higher animals are I.O. systems, input-output systems. Something is going in and something is going out. So um, in two dimensions, they definitely fall apart. And the same is the same happens if you think about um, their nervous system, the nerve, the, the nerves, and the blood vessels. Uh, they shouldn't have any crossings there. Yeah, crossings are forbidden in two dimensions. What about the metabolism on a one-dimensional boundary? Yeah, um, um, complicated atoms and molecules have three dimensions. They couldn't be absorbed, and so on and so on. It. I mean, it's unthinkable. Yeah, so you need three dimensions. Otherwise, uh, um, topologically, um, nature becomes too simplistic. The opposite has been treated by Einstein's good friend, Pavel Sigismundovich Ehrenfest, um, in 1917 already. I mean, this was the times also of Poincaré and the stability of, of the three-body system and so on and so on. And if you watch here at the trajectories, um, if you have a, a heavy mother particle and a light probed particle, Okay, you see that you can have an impact on the, on the mother particle, or you can have a bypass, um, but one, one trajectory is missing, the stable one, which we badly need in astronomy. I mean, we, we want a stable world, yeah, and not the impact or the bypass. So uh, this was also mentioned, the, the simulation was mentioned by, by Techmark um, um, some 20 years ago, and the um, quantum mechanical problem was solved um, some 50 years ago by Tangarini and published in Novo Cimento. So also the, um, the, uh, the atomic system is uh, would, would be unstable in more than three dimensions. So dimension-wise, just to, to make a long story short, we seem to live in, in something like the best of all worlds. I will not go into more detail here. One example which, which all of us know, I think, is this, uh, the, the matter to antimatter ratio I mean, just after Big Bang, we at least assume a symmetric state, and now we have this, uh, this um, factor of 6 times 10 to the minus 10. So the question is, why the hell, first of all, where this asymmetry is coming from, which is still unclear, leptogenesis and so on, and where is this number coming from, and why is it so tiny? I mean, are we living from a calculational error of Godfather that's not very satisfying, as you know? Um, if we would live in a symmetric universe, which aesthetically, designer-wise, would be very nice. We would just live in an empty light bubble, and since light doesn't scatter on light, uh, structure formation would be impossible there. And if um, this ratio would be some orders of magnitude larger, you would have an immediate collapse, recollapse of the universe. So it's also sort of a fine-tuning. Okay, I think we are all physicists here, we know that. Let's switch to cosmology, and I think I can be short here amongst cosmologists. I'm not a cosmologist. Um, and let's briefly uh, remind ourselves of the cosmic inventory. Yeah, first of all, okay, the only natural scale um, of, of, of the whole gravity problems is, is the Planck scale, which, um, which has this size. And an often reiterated question is why is the observed cosmological constant, constant by more than 100 orders of magnitude smaller than this natural scale? You all know of this question. I just want to mention that. 
The opposite question comes from microphysics. If you naively calculate the self-energy of the Higgs boson, not the Higgs-Higgs coupling, which we are going to measure at the LHC, the self-energy diagrams like that, what comes out is something of the order of the Higgs mass itself to the fourth, which is 10 to the 52 times lambda. This is um, the opposite, opposite thing from, from microcosm. And the question is, why is this the self-energy of this scalar field, which is all, all penetrating and omnipresent, why is it so large? Or why is lambda so tiny? It doesn't fit neither to microphysics nor, nor to macrophysics. These questions, I think, um, everybody knows. Then we have other fine-tunings. Okay, as you know, gravity is only attractive, but we had Big Bang, which, which was a big repulsion. And now we have the fine-tuning between, or the, the balance between, between contraction and expansion, um, uh, uh, or repulsion, and or between gravity and um, anti-gravity, if we call dark energy something like anti-gravity. And what we see is that for the moment, um, the universe is just uh, very close to the critical density, or, in other words, the curvature contribution to the universe with a barbaric precision is, is zero. And it's not only zero, it's zero right now. It was not always like that, and it, it, and it, and it won't be like that always. So we are not only living in a, in a, okay, a Euclidean world is not necessarily the best of all worlds, but um, we are also living in the best of all times. By accident, we are living in a time where this is just zero, miraculous. Um, this was already observed by Dicke since he, he made uh, the, the balance um, or the, um, of, of Newtonian constant, then the, the, the original impetus, which is the Hubble constant, um, omega and lambda, and formulated its famous anthropic argument. If there's too little inflation, you have a fast recollapse, normally a super fast recollapse, no time for life. If you have too much inflation, and dark energy, both are probably scalar fields which um, give a repulsion. You have no formation in galaxies and um, uh, no formation of galaxies and stars and hence no life since the universe is pushed apart much too quickly. So there's a sort of a fine tuning plus this fine tuning. Okay, let's briefly have a brief look over the masses, go from, uni from macrocosm to, to microcosm. Um, whilst photon and gluon are massless, um, the weak bosons are very massive. And their mass is governing, uh, governing the weak fusion, that's a weak process, not a strong process, of uh, protons in stars. And if you manipulate the W mass, if you, if, if you increase it, the sun is burning slower, generating less radiation pressure, which would lead to a contraction of the sun, and a different surface temperature, so you would have more UV. This is maybe not so disastrous, but if you lower the W mass by a factor of two, the sun would become bigger and colder and burn much faster, since uh, for dimensional reasons, um, the cross-section goes like the force power of MW, and then you have the density, which has a mild MW dependence. So we would have a, the sun would burn out within a billion of years, which would not allow for higher life. Um, so the W mustn't be much lighter for higher life on Earth. And if we had no Higgs, which fortunately we discovered at CERN two years ago, the W mass would be zero. Um, so without symmetry breaking and with zero W mass, um, the weak burning of the sun would become a strong burning, just a nuclear implosion, uh, explosion which would be definitely not good for the development of, 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 of life. So there's quite some fine-tuning here. The same is true if you consider it's another stupid accident. Normally, the up quarks are much heavier than the light quarks. Not so for U and D. The down quark is heavier, um, which has a consequence that the neutron is heavier than the proton. Now, if you change this, what if, if the up quark behaves, if the UD scheme follows the, the normal up-down scheme? 
then you would have a proton decay into neutrons, neutrinos, both neutral, and the positron would annihilate into photons, which means you end up in a completely neutral universe, which is a very poor one, since the whole beauty of the atomic and molecular, molecular and chemical world would have gone. The only structures would, would, be, um, would be neutron bub droplets and neutron stars and so on, and otherwise a photon and neutrino background as we have today. In this case, even the deuteron would become unstable, and what would not work is uh, trapping um, the protons, the unstable protons in the deuteron, as we have it now the opposite way around. The neutrons in the, uh, through the deuteron and helium bottleneck are in time, or timely, um, trapped in, 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 in deut deuterium and helium. It wouldn't work. The other way around would just would not work. So, the cosmos would be neutral. Uh, no chemistry, no life. Okay, and without a Higgs, let's do the same exercise for the fermions. Uh, we would have an infinite Bohr radius, no bound atoms, no chemistry, no life. So, whatever you do, fre very frequently you end up in a neutral universe or in a universe without bound states. Um, it's amazing that things work like that. So, as we already heard from Paul, I'm just counting how many um, yeah. They could be zero. This would not be a disaster since we thought they were zero for quite some time. I think this would not be so disastrous. We still have 100% parity violation. Uh, a, a larger neutrino mass would, 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 in the early universe, lead to, um, to a recollapse since there was a period which was very much neutrino uh, in the lepton era, very much neutrino dominated. So the neutrino mass shouldn't be too large, since they are very abundant. Um, I don't know the limit, I think. Uh, 1 keV, okay, don't, don't ask me on the limits. Yeah. So, we discussed the number of dimensions, we discussed uh, these parameters, you should, we should avoid double counting here, let's, let's say it's two parameters. We have this matter-antimatter symmetry. Then I did not, did not discuss the symmetry breaking scheme due to the lack of time. It would also lead to a completely different universe. I did not discuss in detail the strengths of the forces except for, for the Fermi constant, which is connected to the W mass. Um, yeah, and all these nuclear physics stuff. So let's come to the anthropic principle. And there's a nice saying by, by Steven Weinberg a physicist talking about the anthropic principle runs the same risk as a cleric talking about pornography. No matter how much you say you're against it, some people think you're a little too interested. <laughs> um, I think times start to change. This statement is, is older. Uh, I can, we can discuss here without me, be, me uh, being ashamed. Yeah, you know what I mean? I briefly mentioned the history it started with a very nice article by Dicke in 61. Then we have this famous book by Barrow and Tipler, The Cosmological Principle, that man not only fits the universe, universe, universe to the man. Um, also Hawking mentions that it's remarkable that the constants are so very finely adjusted. Um, then there was this early article of, by Weinberg on, on the cosmological constant. And also Weinberg favored the string landscape, applied, applied, applied to the string landscape. The anthropic principle may explain how the constants of nature we observe can take values suitable for life without being fine-tuned by a benevolent creator. I should briefly mention this, we can leave for a discussion, some criticisms to the anthropic principle. First of all, as a matter of fact, for the moment, we only have this one universe. Fine. First of all, one may criticize that the anthropic principle is sort of tautology or causal circle, saying we only observe a universe that, that allows an observer. No, no more, no comment. That it's a post-diction, not a real prediction. And then it's often said, since you, you are not allowed to make experiments with the universe, your ethics commission would never allow for that, uh, that you cannot do repeated experiments and um, the fundamental parameters are not derived from first principles. 
a question, not a criticism, is we should clearly differentiate what is tuned. Are the laws tuned? This comes a little bit back to your question. Um, are, and, and if you tune parameters, are these truly fundamental ones or environmental ones? Yeah. Um, I just leave this as a question. We should clearly up our minds. Yeah. Sometimes you can shift the question of parameters down to the laws. That's sort of arbitrary. I leave this as a question. I will be brief on the universe and on the multiverse. We discussed this several times. Linda's famous idea. We had that. I just would like to make one final point. Uh, a historical one, going back to great Kepler, who was, apart from his scientific stuff, writing two philosophical um, uh, books. First, Mysterium Cosmographicum, and 25 years later, the Harmonices Mundi. Um, at that time, he was just knowing five planetary orbits. And he was observing that these, the radii of these orbits just behave like the radii of the circumscribed um, spheres around the five platonic solids, which, by the way, are the four plus one building blocks of Greek cosmos. Fire, water, earth, and fire, water, earth, and I always forget one. And air, air and earth, yeah, and, and air. And then there's a fifth one, which we now call dark energy, or quint essence, that's the essentia quinta, the ether, which was identified by the dodecahedron. That's just a side, a side remark. Um, yeah, we know that this was all bullshit. This was just a stupid accident. The interesting point is uh, there are, we now know, that there are two ways out of a Kepler's mysterium. One is the statistical one, I mean, for sure, there are more planets, more planetary system, more galaxies, and so on and so on. The statistical way out, but also the fundamental way out. To search, instead of making a mysterium cosmographicum, to search for the, for the fundamental law behind his Kepler's three laws, which was Newton's theory of gravity. The point I would like to make here is, you have the, Kepler had the statistical way out and the fundamental or fundamentalist, as you like now in Muslimic times. Um, both were true and did not contradict each other. And I would very much encourage everybody or the, the modern science to follow both. There is no contradiction, you don't know. And for different reasons, both ways out were true and fruitful. And this repeats today with multiverse um, on the one hand, and with a fundamental way out through superstrings and a theory of everything. And this sort of repeats um, Aristoteles' approach, who started with solid physics, for good reason, with physica, and then he created metaphysics, which uh, since uh, four or five hundred years is almost, uh, almost um, changed to an insult. It's not, an ins it's, it's not a, a bad thing. And in this spirit, and we, we, uh, we um, already heard this um, in the talk by Paul, we can go from a universe to a multiverse. That's metaphysics in the positive sense. It's not just an insult, yeah? Let's go back to, to Aristoteles. And um, so the physics of our best of all world could be metaphysics, but please in a positive sense. Here you see our good, good friends. So let me be very brief. Um, this quotation by George Ellis, uh, I just make it short. In looking at this concept of a multiverse and landscape, we need an open mind, though not too open. I think that's a question of a, say, of a healthy balance. It's a delicate path. Parallel universes may or may not exist. It's unproved. Um, we are going to have to live with that uncertainty. Nothing is wrong with scientifically based philosophical speculation, which is what multiverse proposals are. But we should name it for what it is. Let's go back to Newton. Hypotheses, I do not fade hypotheses. Hypotheses non fingo. But on the other hand, I'm very strongly against the disease of Popper always insisting on falsification. He, Popper never meant it like that. That's a different topic. And it's like I come from communist part of Germany. 
Um, I hate uh, it being, being uh, that, that, the, that Popper's books are thrown at me like Stalin's books of dialectical materialism. It's the same sort of, of, of ideology. It's just not true. Popper meant it in a different way. And um, for example, the, uh, Dalton's hypothesis of the atoms, it was a scientific one. Also, he, Dalton at that time was unable to to give um, a, a, a recipe of falsification. Just imagine what would, what would have happened to, happened to, the, uh, to, to the atomic hypothesis with ideologists forbidding discussing that so far on Popper. Um, OK. Einstein asked whether God had a choice and could have made the world any differently. And with these questions, the fine tuning, the anthropic principle, multiverse, all these questions are nowadays still I think one of the most burning questions of physics. Thank you. Uh, now time for questions. Yeah. Uh, just a, a small point about the uh, Deuteron, and because uh, I happened to be writing about this the other day for a magazine, and I got to the point where I said that if the proton were heavier than the neutron, it would uh, decay, and the universe would have no charged particles. And then I thought, well, but of course the protons would bind to the neutrons in the Big Bang and form deuterium, but with the masses around the other way. Uh, it's sort of symmetric uh, with uh, what the reason there are neutrons in the universe is because they bound to the protons early on. And then you mentioned that, well, the, the deuteron would also be unstable. Um, yeah, since the binding, uh, it's binding energy is too, too low. Uh, right, but that's, but that's also a comment about the strength of the, of the Yukawa force, isn't it? So. Uh, yeah. I'm just trying to see what is it that changes the symmetry between the neutrons and the protons, that if you had it round the other way, with the protons being lighter, wouldn't they survive by binding to neutrons in the Big Bang and then forming nuclei in the same way as we used to, for the same reason that neutrons continue to yeah. exist? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's only, it's only 2.2 MeV yeah, that's, of that's binding, I... and so the, the difference between U and D is about uh, 2 or 3 MeV, so if you have that twice, then it's going to be like yeah. 5 or, or 6, and, yeah. so, and so that'll be large compared to 2.2 yeah. MeV. But of course, one can change the strong force at the same time and fix it. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. That's, that's exactly the point. Are there any more questions? If not, let's thank uh, Thomas again.